one. Hey everybody, welcome to the Daily Objective. And today we've got a quite the hot topic to tell you about a guy who goes by the name of Peter, uh, Peter, uh, not gonna work here anymore anyway, as they're saying in uh, Portland State University right now. It's Peter Pagajian. Uh, listen, everybody, this is serious business. You know, we've seen the academic world Peter, getting- Peter Bogosian. Thank you. And if you're wondering who that is, uh, I'll introduce him in just one moment. Please super chat your questions, comments, or just to show support. And remember to consider becoming an Ayn Rand Center UK member as well uh, to help us grow and get exclusive content. So this guy, uh, Peter Pagazian, he has decided to leave his university where he's been teaching. He wrote a, a letter, which uh, we'll touch upon what this letter says is an open letter explaining the process that made him arrive at his final decision. Um, here to discuss it with me is one of, I think one of my favorite co-hosts on the show, uh, a guy who I think Peter follows on Twitter. And, you know, I remember when I had a Twitter, those, those were definitely uh, some good days. Oh, you lost your Twitter. What happened? The left happened. Please welcome Mark Pellegrino. What's up, Rucka? Not much. So uh, do you read his letter or, or are you? I uh... did. I did. And I've been privy to the whole drama behind the scenes because Peter and I became friends over Twitter. One of the, one of the many benefits of Twitter. Uh, I mean, I know we always talk about the detractions, but the many benefits is that I think it's hooked a lot of us people in the intellectual dark web up together. And we've become unintentional allies in the struggle against the big enemy right now, skepticism and wokeism. And so early on, we became we became friends. And before the uh, the hoax, the uh, hoax that he and uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose perpetrated against the academic establishment, he told me a month beforehand, something is going to drop very soon. I want to know if you have my back. And of course I did. And he accurately uh, projected the malignant narcissism of the people he was attacking because rather than check their own issues, uh, their own problems, their own academic failings, uh, they simply attacked him uh, physically, uh, physically, uh, emotionally, verbally. Uh, they, they, they tried to destroy his reputation. Uh, he's been dealing with a lot of stuff for the past few years now that's that I don't think any normal human being with a normal constitution could deal with without having a nervous breakdown. Yes, uh, they've intimidated him. They uh, accused him of being violent with his family, among other things. Obviously, they're calling him racist and all types of stuff. That's just to be expected, sadly. So the university is, not, is no longer a place, at least this university and many others like it, are no longer a place for the search for truth. There are certain Maybe there, maybe there have for a while been some ideas that were kind of off the table, but now it's like it's it's switched over to the point where there's only one acceptable ideology, as he puts it, or philosophy is another way to put it. And probably within that ideology, there is probably uh, there kind of like when uh, when let's say uh, Muslim enthusiasts uh, start to. Uh, figure out uh, what the rules are going to be. You see uh, different sects of Islam start to kind of slaughter one another. So it, it's not enough that just Islam will reign supreme. It's that now the question is, well, which version of Islam, which interpretation and the, the civil war wages? I have a feeling or I can see that even among leftists or egalitarians, postmodernists, uh, however you would describe the prevailing philosophy in these universities, critical race theorists, uh, even even within that community, there is an ongoing civil war. So it's it, it's not enough to comply. You might still be guilty and headed for the guillotine. Um, so Peter Bogosian decided to leave academia altogether, or at, at least for now. He's leaving the, the school where he's been working. Um, he has, according to his letter, and maybe you've known of this, he's, he's done kind of um, satirical He's written satirical papers or he's published satirical kind of studies or theses uh, kind of proposing outrageous things like saying like the penis is uh, what is it like a fake concept uh, that's responsible for global warming, like a social construct. It's like intentionally meant to be absurd, 
But I think he was making the point, like, look what they'll buy into, like, look what passes for intellectual uh, content in today's university. Is that kind of what he was doing? Yeah, that's exactly what he and James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose were doing. They were exposing they were exposing the ideological bent of a particular um, academic field, which they call grievance studies. And they proved that there are no real academic standards, provided they, they peppered their papers with a lot of neo-Marxist uh, jargon. One of their papers, uh, which I think was published in a leading feminist journal, was essentially Mein Kampf rewritten they just they took the same ideas and they just they made it academic speak and it and uh, it became uh, a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal and i know in one one of the journals even asked them to be peers in other words to review academic work coming in that's how absurdly unacademic these journals are so the um the intellectual developments in the world of philosophy inside the philosophy classrooms have manifested and uh, the perpetual skepticism as well as the neuroticism that you would get uh, as a result of skepticism is actually uh, it's taken hold of the culture in these universities. When you say uh, it was essentially Mein Kampf, do you mean what do you mean by that? What do you mean? Do you they mean almost it? they almost transcribed it word for word like uh, I don't know. Some I don't remember the passages exactly, okay. but they they basically lifted Mein Kampf, uh, made it academic sounding enough to be a passable academic paper, and submitted it, and it was I accepted. God help us all. A uh, couple super chats. We got Marilyn with four dollars, and L Lyron Brown with five dollars. American says thanks for the great show. Oh, if you like the show so far, you're gonna love this next part. It's time for everybody's favorite segment, the one where I'm the bad guy. So listen, um, what kind of got me interested in talking about philosophy publicly was kind of uh, noticing that there's this reaction to the social justice left. Um, in Peter's paper, he mentioned <coughs> talking to Carl Benjamin, quote unquote, or Sargon Ab Abakad, as I call him. Um, now, he, Sargon is a guy who I kind of uh, befriended and, and tried to tell about Ayn Rand uh, a number of years ago and other people like him. I thought there's a real like group of people that might be open to something new and fresh and radical, which actually fundamentally uh, detracts with the left or the social justice, uh, you know, philosophy. And I was kind of disappointed. I mean, a few people, you know, there's been some success, like a few people learned of objectivism because of that whole campaign. But uh, largely people like Carl Benjamin and others, I've found that their response to the left has been skepticism and or religion and the two are not mutually exclusive in the in the world of many people and i think in philosophy at large skepticism and religion sort of feed into one another like religion relies on skepticism so that god can answer these uh tough questions in philosophy so i've been sort of uh i've been made kind of cynical in recent years uh so when i see someone like peter bogosian i uh, I definitely want to applaud his bravery and uh, there's with no, uh, no sarcasm. I do applaud his bravery, but my question is what's next or like, what's your alternative? Uh, and increasingly I've seen um, people like Carl Benjamin uh, flirt with religion, uh, hold on to skepticism when faced with like Ayn Rand's arguments. So I guess I wonder uh, like, like, I don't know. I can't even really articulate myself. Like, like, kind of, what's next, or like, what comes of this? Is there is there much to celebrate here, other than than seeing one more guy who's detracting from the left? Uh, is there much else to celebrate? Uh, how do you kind of read the situation? Well, I mean, I think even people like Brett Weinstein and and uh, James Lindsay Pluckrose is a little less engaged in this way, but uh, with the, they're they're not philosophers, so they're they're going towards. They're, they're going towards the light and the light seems to be more or less the establishment right, which is a little bit more open-minded than, than the religious left. The problem is you're right, like Bronze Age pervert and people like Sargon, they're, they're a kind of Sargon, they're whatever this, they're, they're, they're all offering sort of a traditionalist take on, on a solution. And Ayn Rand is falling through the cracks. Now I can understand somebody like a, a James Lindsay going for that. He's a mathematician. He's not a philosopher. He's an amateur philosopher. Somebody like Helen Pluckrose, who I think is, 
uh, literature or sociology, I think is especially, I forget. But for a guy like Peter Bogosian, I would, I would hope, since he is a philosophy teacher, that he would find his way into the objectivist camp eventually, uh, maybe not now. And, and I, think, I think that would be a particularly fertile discussion to have with him. What, what is it about objectivism that, um, that makes him not adopt it as the alternative to wokeness? Why is he going in the direction of sort of the traditionalist right? Which frankly, in our world, in the world of, of, uh, of America is more or less uh, the conservation of classical liberalism, or it used to be, it's not so much that anymore. So um, I would be interested in probing him to, to see what, what contradictions he thinks exist in Rand that make her the, the least palatable um, uh, alternative. Mm -hmm. And when you read Atlas Shrugged, um, it's not like they're all postmodernists. I, I mean, it was published. Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957. I don't. I don't know if postmodernism was even a thing yet, or let alone a household name, or you know, let alone prevalent in university. So Rando's. I mean, my reading of of Atlas is that the villains are can be described as pragmatists, like they're like these sort of uh, <clears throat> short range like hyper focused or not focused but like concrete bound uh short range thinkers <coughs> like basically uh you know basically they the villains in atlas shrugged are saying things that today people are saying is gonna we're gonna use to fight the left you know we're gonna beat the left with pragmatism we're gonna beat the left with uh skepticism and um i don't see that working but i mean i agree with your sense of optimism if i'm if i'm if that's what i'm hearing like just generally it's good to have these conversations it is nice to see objectivists um, in recent years becoming kind of having kind of a seat at the table wherever such members of the intellectual dark web are conversing. Uh, by the way, I didn't realize you were part of the intellectual dark web. If you know any way I can get my card, uh, get in, I, I would love to, uh, I'd love to talk. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the in. Uh... Yeah, you don't consider yourself a part of the intellectual dark web, so to speak. I mean, we're not intellectual, we're not professional intellectuals, but we're people interested in ideas. And, and we certainly gravitate towards the, the stuff that exists on the underside of the culture at the moment. It's, it's starting to find its voice, I think, in a, way that, uh, in a way that it's never had before. And it can become a, a cultural shifter if we keep pushing hard. Um, and, that's, and that, I think, um, and that, I think, is a, is a pretty great advance. Look, I mean, what, what the Jacobins have working against them is that they're so disintegrated and so conflict oriented that eventually they're just gonna turn on each other and, and, and devour each other like the cannibals that they are. The problem is they can do a lot of damage before that. And, and also they can solidify a more organized group on the right that espouses all the wrong values too. Um, this is the thing that I think Iran is most worried about an environmentalist religious uh, uh, centered right wing that uh, becomes the answer to the disintegration on the left. And that's not, that's not implausible. No, I, I definitely see someone like Tucker Carlson, if he uh, gets a, a little bit more uh, into environmentalism, someone like him can have a, a serious uh, chance at becoming leader or yeah. a, a very influential type of person like that. Um, so, I mean, just looking at the title of Peter's paper, it's, it's my university sacrificed <coughs> ideas for ideology. Like, I don't know, does, does, like, what is it? Like, what does that even mean? Like, it, it just, it, that, that does not sound to me like, uh, like a philosophy professor. Um, doesn't ideology basically just mean philosophy? So is that the problem that, that his university had become too philosophical? Like that they chose, a, I guess he's saying that they've shut down debate <coughs> by, by choosing one ideology and, shutting down the others, but it, um, I, I see the word ideology used uh, pejoratively a lot, and I, I kind of sense that's what I'm getting in this title, is that the problem is certainty, the problem is coherence and integration, and that the solution is to remain skeptical and uh, deal, deal with each issue sort of in a vacuum or separately. Um, I agree with you. I think that one of the things I've, I've often discussed with Peter is this idea of provisional knowledge. Um, and he looks at knowledge as provisional or, or, or he looks at certainty as like, he looks at all knowledge as provisional. So you can't really be certain. And I tried to tell him, well, why can't you just accept the concept of contextual certainty so that you, you still embrace the idea that 
new knowledge can be added to the old knowledge and you can still widen your, your conscious uh, embrace of the world? Why do you have to act as if there's the possibility that some contradictory or paradoxical evidence will come in and unseat this valid knowledge that I have. To me, it concedes the skeptic's point, and that's the weakness of his argument, and probably one of the reasons why he doesn't go to Rand. Yeah, and it's, you know, I mean, we got to be realistic. You know, uh, a, a middle-aged or someone well over 30 is generally not going to be so eager for a fresh new uh, uh, view of life that they'll take on a revolutionary philosophy like objectivism, more likely just kind of talking to them and uh, sort of uh, influencing them a little bit and also getting kind of the word out about Ayn Rand is probably the way the culture will change. Um, so I think I, I've matured a little bit as well I, I, as I'm reflecting on my experience talking to people like Sargon and um, looking at the intellectual dark web with such impatience and cynicism. I think I, I've matured a little bit and realized like the battle is not about trying to, in, you know, change the minds of the Peter Pagosians of the world necessarily, but rather to engage with them and um, try to reach their audience and, and build a new audience as well. Speaking of audience, we got Claudia with three euros. Thank you. And Tessie or Tessie with 449 pounds. She says, good job. And now time for a whale super chat. Phil with 50 pounds says, Mark, sorry if off topic. But if you were asked to advise on the format of the UK Constitution, should politicians be personally liable if they pass legislation proven to be detrimental to an individual's inalienable rights or be immune? Well, they are personally liable in that you can vote them out of office, right? <laughs> and perhaps take civil action against them once they're out of office. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's one of many potential solutions to to ending the crisis of of government, continual government expansion. I, I actually think that uh, in our own states and, and probably in the United Kingdom, you needed to convene a constitutional convention and ban the initiation of force from all interpersonal activities. And and once you do that, that makes the regulatory state null and void. But there's too many, you know, golden cows in the in the uh, English uh, social system, um, political, social, socio-political system for them to want to kill it. They, the, the, the pe people themselves have embraced these things. So, um, so here I'm turning in circles, but finally come to this uh, solution. Look, in the end, the voters are voting for these folks and they're putting them in office because they seem to want them. And the constitution of the United States has been betrayed by a political class that has been voted in by the people of the United States who seem to like this idea of spoil system democracy. So um, in the end, regardless of what you do, you're gonna have to re-educate the population. Yes, uh, but with voluntary uh, debate and discussion, not like right. uh, AOC has uh, alluded to with re-education. Um, but yes, the, the solution to our problems is in philosophy. Uh, you know, other than, you know, unforeseen disasters, it is, I think, intellectuals, philosophers who shape a culture, who change the world, who drive history forward. And um, I think what we said, what I said in the Phil-sponsored episode a couple months ago about I think it had something to do with England's unwritten constitution compared to America's written one. I said, if like England were objectivist, if England really, really took property rights and just rights and individual rights very seriously <clears throat> and had an unwritten constitution, I would take that over a written constitution in a country where, you know, pragmatism, skepticism and postmodernism have taken over the culture. So it ultimately it's a constitution, I think, is, is essential for a for a free society, but uh, a constitution at the end of the day can't be protected against irrational ideas. If the people want the government to violate rights, if the people want the NHS in England, if the people want you know, protectionism in the US, then that's what they're gonna get. That's what they're gonna vote for. And that's what the politicians are gonna do. Politicians do what they're told. Uh, at the end of the day, they do run, they look at their constituents, they ask them what they want and they make them these promises. Uh, so it's uh yeah i think we have to get a citizenry that when asked what they want from the political class responds with uh nothing from you thank you just leave us alone yes laissez-faire as the french might put it uh which you know requires protection of rights uh to property and speech and enforcing contract which i think is a uh 
uh, a derivative of that, uh, enforcement of contract, a, a derivative of protecting property rights. So yeah, uh, there you have it, folks. Uh, you know, a lot of shows on the internet would be happy to condemn Portland State University here today. And of course we join them, but unlike most shows out there, I think we are offering a philosophy that uh, could have prevented what the left has done. Uh, please, if you are going to school, in school, or know someone going to school, uh, try to get Ayn Rand into these universities. Uh, for years, there's been a silent, for decades, there's been a silent infiltration of objectivists into the universities. You might not see the results yet, but you might start seeing the results. I think you're starting to see the results. People of, in, in prominent positions in the world of ideas, some of them are objectivists. And that, my friends, is how the battle will be won. So you might want to uh, get your front row seats. Speaking of uh, front row seats, we've got Mary Lean with $5 asking, doesn't Bagazian mean that students are telling students what they should think rather than encouraging a free exchange of many ideas? Um, is that what he means? I think, I, th I, don't, I, think I mean, I think we've, we've been seeing this development from the 60s. I mean, the 60s established this quote unquote counterculture where the students, the inmates begin running the asylum and the, uh, and the faculty, I guess, also sort of inured with a, a kind of skepticism or that Rousseauian sense that youth has, has possesses some kind of wisdom that they've had distilled out of them through their educations. These, they, they let the youth run wild and they, and they let them uh, determine the curriculum and, uh, and they've had a sort of, and that has led us, I think, to this sort of intellectual nihilistic world that we see now where the faculty is fully participating in, in the abuses the student body is perpetrating on other people. It's not like they're even hanging back in a cowardly fashion the way they did in the 60s. They're in it. They're part of it. Um, they, they're, they all have the same, they're all infected with the same bad idea viruses. And Mary Lynn corrects her, her typo with $2 saying universities are telling students. Uh, she, didn't, she meant to say that universities are telling students what they should think rather than encouraging free exchange of many ideas. Yes. But that was a happy typo because it, is, it has become, and this is not just universities. In society, we've got children telling adults how to speak and how to behave and how to live. Uh, but that is the consequence of the philosophy that the adults pass down to them. Uh, so I, I definitely think you do see that in universities. Uh, I remember Brett Weinstein uh, getting cornered by students and told that he's a Nazi or told that he's racist. That, that was a very infamous event at uh, Mount e or Everest. Evergreen. 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 And, uh, you know, in my usual sort of cynicism or kind of um, cockiness, I was like, well, what are you teaching these students? You know, you're teaching them there's no free will. You're telling them culture is biological. So then they accuse you of being part of this deterministic force to oppress them. And you don't want to hear about it. Of course, that me saying that is not going to change the world, but uh, it's gratuitous. And I enjoyed saying it at the time. But I mean, but there is a certain uh, there's a certain there is a certain truth to it. You know, there is a certain uh, how would Rand put it? Brother, you asked for it. There is a certain uh, element of that sentiment. It's just not necessarily the best way to change minds. Um, Jeff with five Canadian dollars says, good job. Thank you. Five Canadian dollars. That's um that's got to be worth something. I'm just not sure what. All right. Well, uh, hey, anyway. the Canadian dollar smells like maple syrup and it's indestructible. So there's that. I'm not sure it can buy a maple leaf, but it certainly smells great. Uh, so that's good. Thank you, everybody, for the super chats and for the support. Please consider becoming a member of Ayn Rand Century UK. We got a link in the description and in the chat. Um, we got some stuff coming up today. First of all, at 7 p.m. UK time, the new show, the hit new show, I'll predict, Enjoy Parenting with Lisa Van Dam. Um, I have a feeling even if you don't have kids, you can learn something from this show. So check it out. Then at 8 p.m. UK time, the communication boot camp with Don Watkins for members only. So all of you lethargic, freeloading, ticks and leeches that are not members you're going to have to suffer <laughs> your poor communication. Um, so might want to become a member. Uh, then coming up at 10 p.m. UK time, the uh, Life on Earth with Robert and Amy. And the episode today is The First Duty of Justice. 
sounds badass. And then at 10.30 p.m. UK time is Life on Earth after show on Clubhouse. Boy, a lot happening today, folks. Where else do you get this much content? Nowhere. Please become a member and help this thing sustain and grow or the left will win. All right. I guess we can jump over to Clubhouse. Uh, thanks for uh, a great discussion. Tell Peter I said what up and I'm looking forward to the next IDW hangout, uh, hopefully coming up very soon. Right on. Thanks, Mark. Thank See you, you everybody. And goodbye. See you.